I have to say that I've been looking forward to this event since I first heard about its inception. Um, the Taiwan test, how to keep democracy alive in Asia, sounds like a fascinating topic. To do this, and to introduce our panelists, I have the utmost pleasure to introduce Rowan Callock, OBE and Fellow of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. He is an industry fellow at Griffith University's Asia Institute. He was Beijing-based China correspondent of the Australian for two terms, following 20 years with the Australian Financial Review, including as China correspondent based in Hong Kong. He was also the Asia Pacific editor for both newspapers. He has won a Graham Perkin Award for Australian Journalist of the Year and two Walkley Awards. So it goes without saying that tonight uh, we have someone of unbelievable wealth of knowledge and experience in this area. I'm now going to hand it over to Rowan uh, to introduce our panelists and uh, run the event. Rowan, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks James. And uh, thank you all those here in the room and uh, uh, those online for participating in our session in one of the most important issues of our times. And may I start by sending the good wishes of all here to the Australia <coughs> Institute of International Affairs, uh, Victoria's um, Executive Director, Alistair Roth, who is addressing health challenges and thanking James for stepping in at such short notice. Thanks, James. Taiwan has emerged in the last few years as a very significant place, not only because the People's Republic of China has, under Xi Jinping, stepped up its rhetoric about annexing Taiwan, but perhaps more importantly, because of what's been happening within Taiwan itself. It's become something of a model for countries transitioning towards democracy, or indeed for those long democratic. It is of course a very beautiful place in landscape, landscape, flora and fauna, and a culturally important one. But more than that, it's evolved into a multicultural society, including indigenous peoples from whom most Pacific Islanders originated of about the same size as the Australian population in which the contest of ideas and policies has become both fierce and fair, in which democracy has taken a very firm grip as a part of what it means to be Taiwanese. This evening, we shall take a look at Taiwan's regional setting, at the PRC's objectives and the odds of its success, and at what's happening inside Taiwan itself. So I'll introduce the speakers briefly by turn, their full bios are available on the gen general information for this event. And after each presentation, I may or may not ask a follow-up question of my own. Then following the three presentations, the floor will be open to your questions. Those here in the AIIA Victoria HQ, please just raise your hand. And those viewing online, kindly type in your questions on the Q&A setting on your Zoom page. First, we're going to Natasha Kassam in Sydney. Natasha, a former diplomat, is director of the Lowy Institute's Public Opinion and Foreign Policy Program, which has just brought out the, the latest of uh, Lowy's fascinating annual polls. And uh, over to you, Natasha. Thank you so much, Rowan and James, for having me. Um, I am obviously devastated that it's not in person, but uh, here we are making this work like it's 2020 again. Um, so, uh, you know, Rowan's asked me to talk a little bit about how democracy is faring in East Asia, the influence of China, and you know, what that means for Taiwan. So I thought I would start out talking quite big picture because I know that Alan and Mark will have really kind of granular, interesting stuff to talk to you about. You know, it will be uh, not a surprise to anyone to realize that as the pandemic and violent conflicts and economic and physical insecurity really ravaged the world in 2020, 
we saw democracy sustain some pretty heavy losses um, when compared to their authoritarian competitors. Uh, the way that Freedom House has described it is the international balance has shifted in favour of tyranny. According to Freedom House in East Asia in 2020, the only countries that they considered to be free were Taiwan, Japan, Mongolia and South Korea. I mean, it's a very small number. And elsewhere in the region, we saw Cambodia's uh, legislature adopt emergency laws to surveil and um, arrest anybody who, ex who dissents. We saw students and academics arrested in Indonesia. We saw broadcasters shut down in the Philippines. Um, even before the coup and the tragic violence that has engulfed Myanmar since February this year, there were already students and activists reporting an uptick in detentions in public uh, for their involvement in public protests. There was a uh, quite brutal force used against public protest in Thailand. And in fact, that was one of the things that saw Freedom House change the rating of um, Thailand to, from partly free to not. And of course, all of this has come as the world has been hit by COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 has been in itself an assault on democratic freedoms, sometimes with consent. Uh, the publics around the world, clearly here in Australia, have been willing to accept uh, significant sacrifices in terms of their personal and civil liberties in exchange for those public health considerations. But what we saw in that larger scale was these widespread protest movements, especially from 2019, really collided with increased repression in 2020. The clearest example, of course, that we're all paying attention to here is in Hong Kong. Um, the last time I traveled overseas before the pandemic was to Taiwan for the presidential election um, with some of my fellow panelists uh, in January 2020. And one of the remarkable things that happened that night was after President, well, during President Tsai's victory speech, you saw the streets filled with people, but there were people waving the Hong Kong flags. Um, President Tsai directly addressed the Hong Kong protesters in her speech and said that she saw the friends from Hong Kong watching democracy in action that night. And after this address was done, the streets were filled with Hong Kongers and Taiwanese walking together, holding up five fingers for the first The way in which the Hong Kong story has changed so dramatically in the past year is just another symbol of the way in which uh, authoritarianism has really, um, well, I don't want to say won, but, you know, gained so much ground and it's just so kind of depressing to see. But what we saw during the pandemic was this debate between countries and publics about the idea of whether an authoritarian system or a strongman system was somehow better equipped to handle the pandemic such as this one you know the idea that democracies were not capable of standing up to this challenge and you know i would argue it was a false narrative we can see that we think uh, clearly in australia's experience over the last year but Taiwan is really one of the exemplars that has been shown as a democratic system that has really managed the pandemic well. The other exemplar, I think, of the other system, an exemplar of authoritarianism is, of course, China. And China has been using the pandemic as well as other measures to offer a new model of governance as an alternative to democracy. <laughs> Democracy is, I think, clearly in decline by every measure we would say, but I don't think it's because democracies can't handle the challenge of a pandemic. I think it's because the countries we consider to be exemplars, such as the United States, are not sufficiently protecting it. And then the allure of authoritarianism is really appealing to populist leaders. So I don't think today's the day to have the debate about whether China is exploiting its model or not. Um, but, you know, I, I believe that China needs to quash freedoms in other countries to some extent to protect its own legitimacy. Uh, Australia has seen that to some extent with, you know, China constantly suggesting that unfriendly media reporting is a problem in China's, uh, from China's point of view. And then we also have heard from China's leader himself uh, at the 19th Party Congress in 2017, Xi Jinping said that um, the banner of socialism is flying, uh, the banner of socialism with Chinese characteristics is flying high for us to see and is blazing a new trail for other developing countries to achieve modernization. So the idea that the Chinese approach and China's system could offer an alternative to other countries. Which brings me uh, 
you know, very briefly to this idea of China's kind of obsession with Taiwan or what I would consider to be an ideological obsession. China's leaders talk a lot about rejuvenation, and that is this idea of their commitment to rebuilding a strong, stable, wealthy, confident nation to reinforce their own legitimacy. From China's perspective, rejuvenation requires um, like economic prosperity and political stability. And then they celebrate much of uh, these kind of historical narratives in order to develop this idea of um, the rejuvenating China. That these narratives cast the party as being central to the modern China project. And what this means is that we see a kind of combination of incentives and prosperity and development goals, but also the kind of darker side of authoritarianism where we see um, mass surveillance and internet censorship and really horrific repression when it comes to a range of ethnic minorities, religious groups, lawyers. The way that Taiwan, in my mind, uh, plays into this is that for the longest time, I think China's been able to build on this idea of the rising tide of development. There's been increasing economic prosperity, econ um, increasing uh, kind of favorable conditions, for lack of a better word, from opening up to the world's economy, becoming more powerful in so many ways, and emerging as a peer competitor to the United States. But today, many of these favorable conditions are gone. In many ways, they are a victim of China's success. Economic growth has slowed, requiring you know, quite painful reforms in China. There are major demographic, environmental channel, in demographic and environmental challenges. So with all of this in mind, I think that China now looks elsewhere for their sources of legitimacy, and it sees annexing Taiwan, or at least <laughs> maintaining the option to annex Taiwan as a part of that legitimacy. What we've seen in recent years is efforts from China to undermine that successful democracy in Taiwan through exploiting social rifts, through disinformation. Um, there's been reports of Chinese officials saying that watching Russia's efforts in Crimea gave them inspiration for ways in which they could mess up Taiwan. Uh, the Global Times wrote in 2016 that they could turn Taiwan into Lebanon. Until very recently, though, I would say China's efforts to undermine social cohesion and to sow social division in Taiwan have been incredibly unsuccessful. There was a strong disinformation campaign leading up to that 2020 election to undermine President Tsai. And, you know, we had record turnout. She had a ridiculously huge number of votes. And after that, had the kind of authority and mandate to be able to guide the country through those early days of the pandemic. I know Mark will talk more about identity, but I would say the more that China has sought to represent the Taiwanese as Chinese, the more they have moved away. But much of that, I will say, just to finish up, is under threat now. And although I remain very optimistic about Taiwan's democracy, and hopefully we'll get to talk more about that, of course, Taiwan is now facing quite a serious COVID outbreak. It's first, essentially, since the beginning of the pandemic. And there's been a really sharp increase in Chinese information operations at the same time that have been targeting Taiwan. Uh, you know, if you're in Australia today, you understand that domestic COVID outbreaks um, are fodder for partisan strife. Um, and we can see this happening here today, but it's, it's happening in Taiwan as well. And there's been rumor mongering and there's rumor mongering, and there's been increasing distrust of the way the government is handling the pandemic. These narratives have been picked up by Chinese state media and by other information actors. So we've seen, for example, um, reporting that suggests Taiwan is giving vaccines to its few remaining diplomatic partners rather than to the Taiwanese public. Or we've seen um, reports that thousands of Taiwanese are flocking to China to get vaccinated um, because it's not, able, it's not available to them in uh, Taiwan. And then there's also, uh, the, the same kind of reporting that we see to some extent here in Australia, the idea that um, old people are dying from vaccination and we've seen vaccination rates in Taiwan fall off quite dramatically. Some of this has been amplified by Taiwanese media itself, which is, um, you know, obviously a free press is an important part of a strong democracy, but uh, Taiwan's uh, press is often described as um, quite sensationalist and quite commercial. So to finish up, essentially, um, I think that, uh, you know, in the bigger picture, democracy is at risk. 
Taiwan has been a kind of exemplar in and a shining light as we've seen democratic backsliding across East Asia. But I do see that as more at risk right this moment than it has been in the past, in part because of the COVID outbreak, in part because of China's efforts to undermine Taiwan's democratic systems. And yeah, really looking forward to hearing more from you all and discussing this with you all further. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, uh, Natasha. Uh, uh, can I just follow up with one with one question about um, uh, Taiwan's relationship with uh, re relationships with uh, the neighbours? So President Tsai has uh, put uh, quite a lot of stress on the uh, the South policy. Um, look South, which may I, I uh, Australia's South as well, of course, but. Uh, principally, this was looking to, I, I think, uh, uh, Southeast Asia. How well has that gone? And uh, is this policy still in place? Yeah, absolutely. So Taiwan's southbound policy, I think, has been in place since 2016. As you say, it actually includes Australia and New Zealand, although that was news to me last time I was in Taiwan. We don't hear much about it here. But it has been, I think, quite successful in Southeast Asia. And um, but um, essentially, just for context, the Southbound policy was aimed to uh, look for new economic opportunities away from China, recognizing that so much of Taiwan's economy is tied up with China. What we saw up until about 2019 is very gradual progress on that front, and we saw that the percentage of Taiwan's exports going into mainland China um, had reduced slightly, and they were starting to increase and show some gains across Southeast Asia at least. That's reversed, I think, last year, partly because of COVID, um, reverting to type, also, you know, working with uh, partners that are more comfortable and have also been more open, uh, having dealt with the virus in different ways. So in economic terms, I think there's been some success and Taiwan's economy is one of the only developed economies to have grown, to have grown in the last year and quite significantly. Politically, I think, is another question. I would say the last year has been uh, very successful in Taiwan's terms, in terms of growing those relationships with its neighbours. We've seen for the first time countries like Japan and South Korea talk about Taiwan's safety and security in joint statements with the United States, for example. You've, you've seen quite a lot of progress in terms of countries that weren't willing to speak out for Taiwan's international participation um, in multilateral forums and now more willing to do so. So, um, you know, in economic terms, I think Taiwan has not yet managed to shift that kind of economic entanglement with China to the extent that it would like to, but in political terms, I think it's um, been able to build quite good relationships with its neighbors and partners. Thanks, Natasha. One more thing. Taiwan's got a very important place, to, uh, role to play in global supply chains, doesn't it? And uh, particularly in uh, semiconductors, I think uh, a vast proportion of global semiconductor production is in the hands of Taiwan companies, particularly Taiwan Semiconductors itself. Um, how important is, is that in terms of Taiwan's influence and in terms perhaps of of why China is so keen to annex it? You know, I think it's incredibly important. If for no other reason, then any kind of annexation of Taiwan would cause such a huge disruption to the region, um, not just to global supply chains, but in terms of refugee on flights, in terms of the safety and security of Japan that is not far away, but also in terms of the global semiconductor industry, of which Taiwan is absolutely central. Um, I think TSMC at last count um, uh, is about 60% of the world's semiconductor supply. So, uh, you know, advanced semiconductors, I should say. Um, so that, I think it, it's incredibly important and for China to annex Taiwan to get access to TSMC, I, I, don't, I don't think that that would be the calculation. In fact, what we're seeing is that China is investing ever, even more into its own indigenous capacity to be able to wean itself off that reliance on Taiwanese semiconductors. They're also putting even more uh, effort into luring Taiwanese engineers to China to try to, again, build that domestic capacity. But it's certainly, I think, the, the, the size of that semiconductor industry and its importance in the world weighs on the mind of 
US government officials, Japanese government officials, and even Chinese officials when they're thinking about the various equities involved in a potential cross-straits conflict. Thanks very much, Natasha. And we'll um, uh, park you for the time being and uh, move on to uh, Alan Dupont. Uh, so Alan is um, professor uh, leading, of leading Australian universities, uh, one of our most eminent experts on strategic affairs, and he's uh, the founder of uh, Cognoscenti, um, the Cognoscenti Group, uh, political and risk consultancy. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you, Alan, also in Sydney. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rowan. Good evening, everybody. Um, I should apologise for my very bland background here. I, with the exquisite timing, I decided to move house on the same day that you're having this uh, webinar. So awesome. all my books and furniture have gone and I'm sitting here on a chair in a desk with my laptop. So there we are. But anyway, uh, we must go ahead. Uh, and I made sure that this was a high priority for the day, Rowan. So let me, um, let me address some questions that have been put to me uh, by Rowan uh, in preparation for this webinar. And the first really is just to look at the strategic setting in the Western Pacific vis-a-vis -vis China. And I, I guess the big point I wanna make is that the balance of military power in East Asia has shifted quite fundamentally, but not in favor of the democracies, unfortunately. And so I just want to unpack that and explain where we are in terms of the military balance. So it's, it may come as a surprise to a lot of participants here uh, because the US has for so long been the dominant power in East Asia, military power. Uh, in, in many respects, the Pacific has been uh, a, a Western democratic um, lake, if you like, for since, since 1945. But over the past 20 years, China has embarked on the most rapid sustained peacetime military buildup probably since the 1930s. And in doing so, the balance of military power has shifted, especially in the Western Pacific and the maritime domain, has shifted decisively towards China. Uh, it will soon outgun and outmuscle the US in East Asia. Again, that's, that probably would come as a surprise to many, many of the participants here. But I'll just illustrate that by just one, one little fact. Um, the, the rapidity of China's naval buildup in particular has got to such a point that by 2030, uh, China's Navy will outnumber the combined navies of the United States and India. So we, ex we anticipate that China will have in its Navy around about 450 ships and 110 submarines, compared with the US, which currently has about 280 ships and around 68 submarines and is likely, unlikely to get more over the next eight years. So I think that has really changed the military equation so quite fundamentally. And it's happened so rapidly that it's taken a lot of people by surprise and only in the recent years have the strategic community in the United States and Australia and, and many of the democracies have woken up to the military challenge that China has presented. And of course, this is not just about China versus democracies. Um, military power, as with most authoritarian states, is seen as the spearhead of state power. So if China wants to be the major, the, the preeminent nation, uh, certainly in East Asia, it has to have the best uh, military and that's where it's headed. So that's, that's quite a fundamental change. Um, a lot of people think that not only will China become the dominant military power, if it hasn't already in, in East Asia, by 2040, it will certainly be uh, the world's preeminent global power, unless something changes. And we can talk about that in a minute. So, um, so that's the sort of really the big point about the military balance in East Asia. It is certainly favoring China and its authoritarian state model. And it's very interesting to see the way in which China uses its military power, uh, not, not in a direct sense, but there is also the, the, on the horizon is always the prospect that China may deploy its military might to achieve its political and strategic ambitions. Um, so from, from a Chinese point of view, uh, the best way to, to win, if you like, in the contest with the United States and, and, and democracies is not to have to use that military power overtly, it's just the mere threat of it 
the mere fact that China has is seen by other states as having uh, preponderant military power, basically forces other countries into a form of subjugation. Uh, and that is the risk to democracies in the region, not that necessarily China is going to invade anybody, although there's, there's a possibility, and we'll talk about that with Taiwan in a minute. But the fact that it has preeminent military power and it's prepared to use it is going to make a lot of countries think twice about taking China on. It, it actually conditions people to appease China and give China what it wants without China having to use that military power. So uh, a couple of points I just to add to that. Um, it's not only about military power. Uh, the, the alliance system that sustained the United States and what Australia has benefited from over the last uh, 40, well, sort of 65 to 70 years now is fraying at the edges because China has tried to drive a wedge between the countries, the members of ANZUS. It's already peeled off Thailand. Uh, South Korea is really hemmed in. It's a bit difficult for, for South Korea to do much that is contrary to China's wishes. Only Japan, Australia, and probably the United States are standing firm in resisting a Chinese assertiveness in, in the region. The Quad Repartite Alliance is, is, is a, a possible counter to China's power in the region. That can, that's that's uh, the United States, Japan, and India, and Australia together. But again, that's a very much a nascent, uh, it's not really an alliance, it's, it's, it's a, it's a coalition of states that are united in their desire and need to push back against China to balance Chinese power, but it's far from being a military alliance. Uh, so that has its limitations. So on, on the other side of the coin, of course, China is often characterized as a lonely power, and that's partly true because it doesn't really have alliances or that has accommodations with countries, but it's a very, a uh, very large and powerful lonely power, and that compensates. So China doesn't really need any other country to come to its assistance. It's because it's, it's a country of 1.4 billion people, and it has an enormous capacity to get its way without relying on other, other countries to support it. So that's the sort of the equation, in, simply speaking, uh, on the military strategic side of the house. Now, it's not only about military power too, we need to think about the way in which China uses its statecraft, all the instruments of state power to achieve its national interests. And in particular, it uses a technique which is often described as, as gray zone tactics. Other terms for it are hybrid military power or threshold warfare. So if I can just define gray zone activities, they're really coercive statecraft actions short of war designed to achieve the user nation's strategic goals and, and, and national interest goals. Now, I'll give you a few examples. Um, we're talking about um, the use of influence and interference operations that we've seen play out through the region and particularly in Australia, the coercive use of trade and economic levers, uh, the militarization uh, of the South China Sea, using uh, its fishing fleet, and its uh, Coast Guard to achieve its strategic goals without actually using its Navy. Um, we've all seen how that's played out over the last five years. The use of paramilitary forces uh, that are deniable. So for example, we see on a lot of Chinese fishing vessels, um, we see basically paramilitary units that report directly to Beijing and are part of a broader network at the spearhead, if you like, of China's naval power in the region. Now, this is something that's very difficult to combat. So we get uh, references to little blue men. So this, this, is a ref this is a sort of reflection of what Russia has done in Ukraine with, with putting in clearly Russian uh, military forces, but in a deniable way. They wear no identifying patches, green uniforms, and they're deniable. Russia says there are no Russian forces in Ukraine. And China has taken a leaf out of Russia's playbook, if you like, in the maritime domain to have its sort of little blue people do the same things. So these are the sorts of tactics, the grey zone tactics that are difficult to combat. Uh, and China has used very effectively to get its way uh, in the South China Sea, also the East China Sea, and more broadly uh, throughout the region. The other, I think, primary example of the way in which uh, 
China uses all instruments of state power uh, to achieve its strategic goals is the use of economic coercion. Now, Australia has been on the receiving end of this, as, as we all know, over the last 12 to 18 months. But it's not just Australia that's been singled out for coercive uh, trade pressure. Uh, China has employed this in, with 27 other countries around the world. Uh, so it is clearly part uh, of its statecraft. It uses inducements in the form of debt trap diplomacy to appeal to developing countries, to invest in developing countries, to make it attractive for them to sign on to China Inc. But the other side of that, it also uses coercion and threats to get what it wants. It's a combination of two. So that there's, mm. there's two sides of the way in which uh, China uses the statecraft. So the, the risk there is that China can use that statecraft to get its way without having to use military power whatsoever. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you've basically done a debt for equity deal with China and you're a developing country and you can't pay back the loan, then China is quite happy to take equity in a port or an airfield, uh, often exclusively, uh, so you get little enclaves or Chinese bubbles in countries around the world, from Argentina right to the Pacific uh, and even in Europe now in Montenegro, for example, or in Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan. So you can see the way in which China uses all the instruments of state power in a way that democracies can't do and don't do. Because authoritarian states have some built-in advantages in the way in which they can monopolise, or they can mobilise, I should say, all elements of state power towards a, towards a strategy that can be sustained and supported financially over a long period of time without any opposition, without any NIMBYs to, to, to create problems for the government. And that, of course, is all led by the Chinese Communist Party with, with the great helmsman Xi Jinping um, leading the way. So that's, uh, that's the second uh, problem for democracies and how, you, how we combat that. Now, is it conceivable that China could use these techniques to forcibly bring Taiwan back into the bosom of the motherland, so to speak. Um, now, this is the Taiwan problem has been around for a long time. Natasha has talked about it fairly extensively in her comments. But the real risk here is that she, she appears to have decided that the time has come to, to reunify forcibly, if necessary, Taiwan. And if you look at numerous statements that he's made over the last five years, it's pretty clear that that's his intention. Time is running out to do it. He's 68 now. Um, there's only so much time that he has left to see this and, and to join the pantheon of Communist Party heroes as the, as the liberator of Taiwan. Now, what stopped China from doing this in the past is it hasn't had the military and economic power to do it. And I think the internal assessment of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is that they are on the verge of having the ability to subjugate Taiwan, if necessary, by force, because their military now is in a position to stop the US 7th Fleet starting to the rescue of Taiwan as it did in the 1996 crisis, uh, because the balance has changed in China's favour, particularly in that area around Ch along China's coastline. Now, I, I think that China, I can't actually see China invading Taiwan um, in a kind of world, as you would see in a World War II movie, as a John Wayne movie, that you're getting on the, on the ships and just invading Taiwan. I think what they would do is seek through a process of attrition to wear down Taiwan's morale, um, to, to exhaust its military by continually flying into its, uh, its airspace, as it's been doing for the last six months very provocatively, and to have the ability to cripple China, uh, to Taiwan's infrastructure, water, power, energy, its banking system, to be able to close all that down in, uh, prior to a military invasion of Taiwan. So I think you would see that is the most likely, that is the way that I think it's most likely to play out. Invading Taiwan is an extremely risky undertaking full of uncertainties but I believe that Xi Jinping is a risk taker 
and he believes that uh, he must achieve reunification with Taiwan in his lifetime. So I think there's a real, uh, real risk that in the period 2025 to 30, um, Xi Jinping may seek to bring China into, into sorry, Taiwan into mainland China and reunify forcefully um, the, the two polities. And that's the risk. Now, the final question that uh, Rowan put to me was, if that were to occur, how hard would it be to keep Taiwan subject? And that's a very interesting question. Um, when I thought about this, so it's, you know, my sort of initial response would be, it would be a very difficult thing. But when I thought about it further and watching how China, the Chinese template in Hong Kong, it became clear to me that China has put a lot of time and thought into subjugation of Taiwan. It's no good if you're going to go to the trouble of militarily uh, taking over a, a fairly large island of 24 million people, you don't want to declare victory on day, on week six, as George W. Bush did in Iraq um, all, that, all those years ago, because the real conflict would take place then. Taiwan is geared for guerrilla war. It's going to be a very tough nut to crack. Um, so you may see resistance play out for, for many months. But bottom line is China has such overwhelming military power. I don't think the US could come to its rescue because it would be its military forces would be at risk from Chinese missiles, among other things. And that over time, China would put so many troops onto Taiwan that it would eventually pacify Taiwan, even, even a population of 24 million. The real question is, of course, what would the rest of the world do? And that's, I think that's probably the subject for, a, for a, another webinar because I don't really have time to sort of elaborate on that. But other than to say that um, the real key question as to whether China could continue to subjugate Taiwan would be whether the US in particular, but other countries be, would be, whether they would be prepared to support a Taiwanese resistance uh, militarily if necessary. And at the moment, that seems unlikely, but you can't rule that out. Now, a lot depends on how the crisis plays out. And I believe that there is, there is probably a 50% chance that we're going to see something like that occur in this region over the next five to eight years. So I think um, I may have run out of time here, so I'll, I'll leave it at that, and I'm more than happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alan. That's uh, a very chilling a very chilling presentation. Um, I, I've got a couple of more things to uh, to ask you. First one is: um, Is Taiwan itself, uh, the, the government of Taiwan and the Taiwan military, um, is it investing enough in its own defence? This has been a criticism levelled in some quarters in the United States. Uh, uh, I, I wonder what you feel about that. No, look, I, I'm of the view that Taiwan has not invested well in its defence. Uh, I think there are two reasons for that. First of all, the assumption from, from Taiwan's leaders for a long time has been that the US would come to the rescue. Uh, it had to do something for itself, but primarily the US would provide not only a nuclear umbrella, but it would also provide superior conventional military forces to combat any attempt by China to take Taiwan by force. Uh, and I think only belatedly have they come to realise that, that the balance of power has now shifted decisively in favour of China. That strategy will no longer work. And they're now scrambling furiously to make up lost ground by developing the capabilities they need to combat China. And so the, one of the problems they, they have is they put all their eggs in big weapon systems, which are relatively easy to knock out. What they need to do is have a completely different strategy where they have small, highly mobile forces with lethal high technology weapons that are very difficult to take out and you have lots of them, okay? Taiwan is eminently defendable with the right strategy and the right military capability, regardless of what the US does. So that's, I think the Taiwanese leaders have now recognised that. And if you look at their, their forthcoming strategy, it's going to spell this out, I think, quite clearly. The problem is, have they left it too late? And a lot of people think they have. So that's, the, that's my concern about Taiwan's defence strategy up until now. Thanks very much, Alan. And one more question. Um, what, what's the repercussion for Australia? Uh, 
uh, for a Taiwan with uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, flying its flag uh, above the government in Taipei? Well, I don't think that would be a good outcome for Australia, <laughs> whichever way you look at it, right? So, very quickly, the first of all, it's Taiwan is an enormous dilemma for Australia. You know, um, if we get involved in the conflict, then of course China is going to see us as a combatant. And if we think we've been getting a big stick the last 12 or 18 months, it's going to be, it'll be a lot worse. So, so it, there is, it's a high risk sort of outcome for Australia and we're caught between a rock and a hard place. So if we were supporting Taiwan and the US against China, then we would become a target for China in a way that uh, most Australians wouldn't conceive, including a military target. On the other hand, um, if the US asked us to come on board a democratic response um, to a Chinese invasion or attempt to take down Taiwan, and we said no, or we sat on the fence, uh, it would have enormously negative repercussions for our alliance relationship with the United States and more broadly for our position as a robust democracy that presumably would be supportive of Taiwan's democracy. So that, that's the dilemma. Uh, and of course, it all comes down to the detail of how a crisis might develop. Uh, you know, Australia might be able to get away with sending uh, some token force, but I don't think that would satisfy the Americans. The Taiwanese would see that as a betrayal of, 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 of uh, another democracy. They would expect us to do more. And other countries in the region would be looking at what Australia did too, to see where, you know, do we put our money where our mouth is, so to speak, democratically. So if we, if we say that we're in favour of robust democracies and political participation, and, and China uses military force to subjugate uh, a democratic uh, entity like um, Taiwan, and what does it say about our commitment to democracy? So these are the sorts of questions that we would be confronted, our policymakers would be confronted with, obviously. Thanks, Alan. And uh, let's hope these are questions that are being indeed considered in Canberra as we, uh, as we speak tonight. Um, if I can, uh, <laughs> people are shaking their heads in the audience. <laughs> uh, Thanks, Alan. If we can move on to uh, Mark, to Mark Harrison. Uh, Mark is Senior Lecturer in Chinese Studies at the University of Tasmania. And uh, please don't blush, but uh, you, Mark, you are Australia's most respected expert on Taiwan. So uh, welcome uh, aboard from Hobart, and uh, we look forward very much to hearing what you have to say. Oh, well, thank you, Rowan. That's very kind of you to say. Um, uh, like Alan, you, you present me with some questions to respond to for this, this presentation. And you know me well because um, the, the kinds of things I like to say are the questions you ask me to, to respond to. Um, you wanted me to say something about Taiwan's history. And I think its history really bears upon responses to a kind of military threat over, from China um, uh, and uh, um, the way the Taiwanese will think about resistance and so on if there's a um, uh, something terrible does happen. So history is incredibly important when we think about Taiwan. It's also a poorly understood history. Um, and so I'll just say um, some, make some points about the history that are really relevant as we think about um, what Taiwan, Taiwan's place in the world. Um, you asked me to identify some key historical dates. And the first one is 1895. Uh, which is when Taiwan was uh, ceded to Japan as a colonial territory by the Qing Empire. So Taiwan became part of Japan before the end of the Qing Dynasty, which is 1911, um, and the founding of the Republic, which is 1912. Um, and in many ways, you know, the Taiwan story is about where empires drew their boundaries at their end. Um, and we can make an analogy with the end of the Ottoman Empire or the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you know, big empires that, uh, that ended at, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, and drew and nations emerged in their place with particular boundaries. And in many ways, the story of the 20th century has been contestation of where those boundaries are drawn. And Taiwan can be understood in that context. Um, the story of Taiwan's Japanese history, um, a remarkable one, um, very strong resistance uh, to Japanese colonization, both um, 
military or, or violent resistance as well as civic resistance, but also an experience of, of modernization. In many ways, you know, modern Taiwan was created in the first half of the 20th century. So urbanization, industrialization, industrial agriculture, all of those parameters were established during the Japanese colonial period. Um, uh, this, uh, this month is, um, or the beginning of next month, is being celebrated as the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, founded in 1921. Um, it's also this, the, the 100th anniversary of the foundation of the League for the Establishment of a Taiwan Parliament, uh, which campaigned for almost 15 years, um, from 1921 until 1934, uh, for the establishment of self-rule for Taiwan uh, during the Japanese period. It's a really long history, very compelling history um, of the really deep engagement with uh, Taiwan's place in the world and its modernization. And then, of course, um, Japan took its turn towards uh, militarization and um, its own uh, adventurism. And of course, Taiwan as, as part of Japan was very much uh, drawn into that. Um, the Taiwanese were um, considered to be Japanese, and so they fought uh, on the Japanese side during uh, World War II. In Australia, there was about a thousand Taiwanese were interned. Um, for the duration of World War II, because we classified them as, uh, as Japanese citizens. The next date is, um, at the end of World War II is 1947, which is the 1947 uprising that began on February 28th. So Taiwan was um, claimed by the Republic of China in 1945 and, and taken over by the ROC. And then of course, um, 18 months later in 1947, there was an uprising against the Chinese nationalists uh, who'd taken control of Taiwan. Um, the nationalists crushed the uprising with incredible violence. So tens of thousands of people were killed, uh, tens of thousands were um, arrested and, and, and uh, imprisoned, tens of thousands fled um, to Hong Kong and the United States. Um, so a really traumatic event um, in the history of Taiwan, in many ways the most important event in the history of, of modern Taiwan. And then of course in 1949, the national government of the Republic of China fled the mainland and relocated to Taipei. So this event um, speaks of um, a history of a trauma, of, of violence, um, and a, a really, really difficult history, and one in which, uh, in many ways, the distinction between Taiwan and China was, was written in blood, as it were. Also geopolitically very significant because um, it was widely understood that this had happened around the world. Uh, the United States in particular was horrified and um, the United States began to reduce its support for Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists as a result of the 1947 uprising. And it only turned that around with the outbreak of the Korean War. So uh, very significant. If, if uh, 228 hadn't happened, you know, it could have been a very different outcome um, for the end of, of the Civil War. Um, uh, of course, the 228 incident or the 47 uprising was completely erased from Taiwan's public life and political life for the next 40 years. It was forbidden to discuss. Um, so very similar, uh, an analogy with um, the Tiananmen Square up, um, massacre in 1989 for mainland China. So if you look for um, discussion of it in the uh, 60s and 70s and, and into the 80s, you, you find nothing. Um, then, of course, in 1987, which is the last date that I have here, um, Taiwan transitioned to a democracy. So martial law was lifted. Um, one of the really amazing outcomes of that was an explosion of writing about Taiwan's history, particularly the 228 incident. Um, so you, know, you go literally from nothing from 1949 until 1987, and then from 1987 onwards, there are literally tens of thousands of articles and books published um, in a very short space of time. Um, democratization is really um, a fascinating uh, experience for Taiwan, uh, quite a complex, very complex process. Um, a really important event was the 1991-92 um, Constitutional Reform Commission, uh, which um, made changes to the Republic of China constitution, which maintained the status quo across the Taiwan Strait, but also created the conditions for democracy. So a really complex change, but very, very skillful change on the Taiwan side. Um, the other thing about democratization after 87 is there was really only the beginning of a process for the Taiwanese. And it's not an exaggeration to say that the Taiwanese have spent the last of the, the, the 35 years since really trying to come to terms with the history of political violence, authoritarianism, and so on. Um, this 
a long, long story of juridical, cultural, social, political change over that period. And in many ways, it's only the last decade that some of the really important events around truth and reconciliation have really moved to the very centre of Taiwan's public life and, and political life. So it's a really, really complicated story. Um, and it's one that really um, we have a lot to learn from in Australia, I believe, very strongly, uh, particularly around truth and reconciliation. We're, we're decades behind where the Taiwanese are today. Um, and it's also one that informs political action and political life and mobilizes the Taiwanese experience in a really profound way. Um, so when we think about um, the, the question you have of um, how do the Taiwanese see themselves and their place in the world, um, in many ways, you know, the answer is the question. They see themselves as, as having a place in the world and as being Taiwanese because of their very, very uh, uh, detailed and, and compelling engagement with this very, very complex history. Um, I mean, in Taiwan today, if you, if you go there, as you would know, um, just that history is everywhere. It, it, is, it, it, it uh, permeates through all aspects of public life. So there's very visible engagement with this history. Um, and this is sort of the making of Taiwanese identity in this, uh, uh, through this very open, very creative. Um, I acknowledge uh, um, Natasha's comment about um, a very noisy and, and acrimonious media landscape. Um, some of the debates around identity and, and, and politics and so on are not incredibly edifying. Um, uh, there's, there's not a lot of tone or, or, or like everything is discussed at, uh, at 11, um, regardless of what it is, it, whether or not it's, um, you know, an invasion by China or, um, you know, pet registration laws, you know, they're all discussed at the absolute maximum. Um, so it is a it is a very intense uh, public life, um, but it's part of of the Taiwanese experience, as I say, one that um, we can learn from. Which alludes to your last question, which is Australia Taiwan relations. Um, I think it's fair to say that Australia Taiwan relations are very cordial, very warm. Uh, we have an office in Taipei, which does a great job. Um, the Australian office um, staffed by very committed uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade people. Um, same time, very overshadowed um, with, a, with the relationship with China. Uh, there's a long-standing um, uh, tendency to see it as a zero-sum game. So anything we do with Taiwan is something that costs us with China and vice versa. Um, we have a one-China policy, which um, is deliberately ambiguous uh, concerning our, uh, our Australia's position on the status of Taiwan in the international system. Um, but it, it, it sets limits. And because we don't have diplomatic relations with Taiwan, um, there are very significant constraints on uh, the extent to which the relationship can be developed. It's also relevant in the current moment because obviously Australia-China relations are um, not particularly positive. Um, but we haven't seen from the Australian government really any substantive movement to upgrade or improve relations with Taiwan, which is pretty uh, very frustrating, I can tell you, from the Taiwanese side. They're, they're really looking for something and, and nothing's really arrived. Um, you know, the FTA, which has been floating around for the last five or so years, is not moving forward and it's not going to move forward. Um, so um, even though relations with China are, are bad, there hasn't been any kind of upgrading on the um, uh, on the Taiwan side from Australia's point of view. So we could do a lot more. Um, we could also learn a lot more from Taiwan uh, than we've been willing to do. Um, we don't have a lot of uh, policy depth um, to really understand the Taiwan story. In our public institutions in particular, um, there's very, very poor understanding of Taiwan. So there's a long way that we can go um, to really take on all of this history and, and build this relationship. And I'll stop here. Thanks so much, Mark. You've covered a lot of ground there. Um, could I, uh, I'll ask you a couple of things. First of all, um, uh, why is it that uh, the Chinese Communist Party today insists that Taiwan is and always has been a part of China? And uh, of course, all people who look Chinese are sons and daughters of the Yellow Emperor's uh, sort of uh, view that even people with, uh, with uh, citizenship elsewhere are kind of really part of that, that empire. But when you look on maps, uh, you see, for example, that Mongolia uh, 
was a part of the uh, of the Qing Empire, but uh, no one seems to be uh, preparing to uh, shoot missiles at Mongolia uh, at this moment. This is this is all very puzzling, and the extent to which this is so uh, emotional as as an issue uh, for the Chinese. Have you got any explanations of this? Um, I think there's a, a couple of a number of different dimensions to it. One is it's a Chinese nationalism, um, so Chinese nationalism, which is where you get a lot of the emotion. So Chinese nationalism uh, is particularly fixated upon certain um, ways of thinking about Chinese history, the the century of humiliation, and so on. Um, and so there's there's a lot of that um, uh, attention in, in in China's public life, and Taiwan is in, in many ways a a, um, a um, it's a, a, a site at which a lot of this emotion is, can be directed. Um, it's a way in, of sort of releasing in some ways a lot of this, this anxiety around China's place in the world. You know, Taiwan is a metaphor um, for, uh, for this, this nationalist historiography. Um, there are also particular historical moments and, and particular structures in the party state system which think about Taiwan in very specific and, 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 and strange ways. The first one, of course, is that the, the party state or the, the Chinese Communist Party has not always been as committed to reunification or unification um, as it has become in the last 20 odd years. If you go right back to um, uh, before the founding of the PRC to the 1930s, um, it was pretty sanguine about the future of, of Taiwan. So it's certainly grown as an issue over the decades. It's also had different ways of thinking about it during the Mao period. It absolutely understood it as a, a um, uh, a military conflict, but then in the post Mao period, it reframed it as a, a party to party issue between the KMT and the CCP. And that I think speaks to a lot of the, the, the problems that the CCP has. Um, because it's so ideological as an organization, it's really, um, it, it defines the Taiwan story as really one to do with the civil war um, and, and the, the, the intertwined histories of the KMT and, and the CCP. Uh, and they are very intertwined. And um, because of the nature of the party state system, it doesn't really have the capacity to actually ask itself whether that's the right way to think about Taiwan. Um, and in fact, of course, Taiwan has its own history, which is separate from all of that. And Taiwan's politics are directly connected to the Japanese period. Um, and, and China struggles to make sense of that. The most uh, the clearest example for me is the refusal of Beijing to speak to Taipei now that there's a DPP government. Um, and they, so they won't speak to them at all. They would speak to the KMT very readily. In fact, uh, Xi Jinping met Ma Ying Zhou and the former president in 2015. Um, but they just won't speak to the DPP. And the reason why is because the DPP don't fit in their worldview. And their response to that is not to think maybe our worldview needs to be changed. It's um, we just won't speak to them. And so there's a lot of very strange aspects to, um, uh, to these, uh, uh, to, the, to the claim, as it were. Um, it's contingent, it's emotional, it's nationalism, it's all of those things, and that makes it very hard um, uh, to respond to coherently. Thank you. Um, I should say my own experience of, of my quite a few visits to Taiwan and stays there is that um, uh, rather puzzlingly for uh, some Australian friends uh, that uh, most particularly younger people in Taiwan don't really obsess about the relationship between Taiwan and mainland China. This is not something that they're really particularly concerned about. It doesn't feature as a major item in elections and so on. Rather like uh, for those of us here who've um, spent time in Seoul, people, even though it's only 50 kilometers from the North Korean border, um, particularly younger, younger South Koreans really don't think about North Korea uh, for more than a few minutes of a year. <laughs> but, but for foreigners, this is seen as a, an all-consuming um, all consuming issue. So I'd just like to ask you, uh, uh, Mark, how do people in Taiwan view themselves when they're polled and so on? Do they view themselves as, uh, uh, as Chinese? How do they describe themselves? Yeah, so there's a lot of opinion polling done. Um, and I, I think that opinion polling in Taiwan is itself, is itself part of the kind of 
how uh, Tony's identity is, is, is practiced. Uh, they're very, the Tony's people are very obsessed with their own identity. Um, and you know, all of the data is pretty clear. It's a, a declining number of, of people in Taiwan identify themselves as only Chinese, a declining number as uh, both Taiwanese and Chinese, and a rising number as, as uh, only Taiwanese. Um, and I think the idea that Taiwan is an, uh, Taiwanese-ness is an identity of its own, a sort of a legitimate identity is the dominant, um, is far and away the dominant position. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, the Taiwanese would be very happy not to be hostile or, or, or concerned about uh, China. Um, I think they just want to be Taiwanese in the world and to be treated with dignity as a people in the world. We talk about this sort of pro-independence, pro-unification. Um, you know, independence is a, is a bit of a misnomer. The, the aspirations of the Taiwanese is for uh, recognition and dignity as a people in the international system as Taiwanese. I think that's really what it's about. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. And uh, the, the, uh, you mentioned the Guomindang, who of course ruled China for uh, several decades and um, with whom the uh, Chinese Communist Party fought that uh, terrible civil war. Um, it's important for a, a lively democracy to have uh, contestation. What's the, will, will or can the KMT uh, return? Uh, they seem to have fully subscribed to uh, democracy and, and it was under a KMT government that that the first elections were held. What, what's your view about uh, contestation in Taiwan in, the, in that area and the KMT's uh, future? Look, um, it's fair to say they're in a bit of a mess at the moment. Um, you know, they're kind of throwing a lot of things at the, at the, the DPP government and trying, to see, and trying to see what will stick. Um, you know, they had a kind of populist experiment in the, in the, the previous presidential election, which was a disaster. Um, there's, there are modernizers in the party who have a kind of old guard um, that they, they're fighting against. So they're in a bit of a mess um, as a political party at the moment. They've been around a very long time, though, uh, since uh, 1911. Um, and I'd say, I, I mean, I, I and for a party of, of such uh, importance globally and, and, um, and of such history, it is a bit unedifying for them to be in, in the state that they're in. Um, but but they, could, they could pull themselves back together. Um, one has to remember um, the Democratic Progressive Party losing the 2008 election, being completely smashed. And, um, you know, their obituary was written pretty vigorously um, uh, after that election. And the DPP came back um, strongly. Um, so I think the KMT can do the same thing. Um, they might not win the next election, but they'll probably get a lot closer than they did uh, uh, in 2020. Uh, uh, yeah, 2020. Um, we do have local elections um, uh, at the end of um, next year, and that'll be an interesting test to see if they're, they're getting themselves back in shape. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks, for, thanks a lot, Mark. And now it's over to uh, over to you. Um, we've got uh, quite a few questions uh, uh, from those of you who are online, and uh, I'll start with uh, with asking asking one. Uh, uh, first of all, um, what do the panel uh, think about uh, uh, this? this conjecture that the United States may be inhibited in aiding Taiwan uh, by its recent experience in Afghanistan and before that uh, Iraq, Vietnam, and also by uh, its concerns about China, China being a nuclear power. Perhaps we'll start with, uh, with Alan and then if Natasha and Mark want, want to add. Yes, well, look, I think it's, it's a complex set of calculations that any US policy maker has to, has to go through in finessing the position on Taiwan. So the core, the core position of the United States is that there is a Taiwan Relations Act which obligates the United States to provide, to ensure that Taiwan can defend itself. It doesn't obligate the US to come to its assistance under any circumstances. Uh, so it is a qualified commitment, but nevertheless, it is a mandated commitment supported by Congress. So, so, so first of all, the US 
uh, does have a position and it has consistently had this position that would support Taiwan if it was threatened, okay? But it's left ambiguous. So th there's the notion, so the US uh, deliberately uses the notion of strategic, strategic ambiguity to make it more difficult for China to be sure what the United States would do. Now, on the question of whether um, US policy has been shaped by its previous historical experiences with Iraq and Afghanistan and so on, I actually don't think that plays out uh, very strongly in the Taiwan case because Taiwan, you know, the Taiwan problem goes back, right back to the essentially the 1949, 1950. So all these other examples have come after that. So I don't think it substantially changes the US position or really shapes it. What, what, what really does matter and what has been the key cal uh, sort of calculation for US policymakers since the opening to China is that relations with China have previously been seen to be so important that the, the US wouldn't want to risk the relationship with, with um, China, except in a direct attempt by China to invade Taiwan. So in all other circumstances, the US would be trying to maintain reasonable relations with China. Uh, but I think that the mindset in Washington has changed since the Trump administration has continued under Biden, whereby the US now sees Taiwan, first of all, now directly being threatened, and the US needs to make a stand on that because democracies more broadly are being threatened by China. And that's coming through very clearly now in Congress. And it's the one issue that unites both sides of the House. So I think that's the key calculation now. And it's really strengthened the US uh, likely commitment to defend Taiwan uh, because now China is seen as if not an enemy, is certainly uh, the major competitor and, and therefore Taiwan must be defended under virtually any others, un, under any circumstances. The real question is how is Taiwan to be defended? And, and that's, that's the question that I'm happy to unpack later on if we have time. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Do <coughs> Natasha or Mark want to come in there? If... No, look, I'd agree with everything Alan said, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I would just briefly add that uh, there is quite a significant gap in the United States between the opinion of elites and the opinion of the public. So elites are very much, if you look at, for example, surveys by the CSIS, um, elites are very much in favor of defending Taiwan. There's less support for that in the, in the American public. And I would argue that low levels of support for deploying the military overseas in both the American public and the Australian public is directly connected to fatigue associated with the forever wars in the Middle East. But there is, I completely agree with Alan, there is high levels of support at the elite level and particularly in Congress, I think we have the highest level of support for the US since 1979. Sorry. Thank you. Um, the next question I'll ask is about, uh, uh, Natasha's already touched on this about the impact of what's happened in Hong Kong in the last year with the we're actually tomorrow is the anniversary of the or tonight the anniversary of the national security law being uh, rushed in um, the, f the first year um, the the changes in Hong Kong have been dramatic this question is uh, uh, do panelists think that uh, Having looked at what's uh, what's happening in Hong Kong, many Taiwanese people will be thinking of leaving and looking to live elsewhere as uh, uh, out of concern that may be their fate uh, in the future, uh, having seen what's happened to Hong Kong. So I think there's a few things to unpack there briefly. The first is that it's true that since the 1970s, China had suggested that the system with which Hong Kong was returned to the mainland, one country, two systems, would also be an appropriate model to bring Taiwan back into the fold in Beijing's eyes. So there is that idea that has been touted from time to time that Taiwan could fit into the same model as Hong Kong. But I would argue that the comparison stopped there. Hong Kong and Taiwan are incredibly different places. They have been for you know, millennia even, 
Um, when people compare the experience of a Hong Konger to the Taiwanese, I think they're overlooking that insofar as there has been this kind of great uprising and uh, call for greater democracy in Hong Kong, it has been very much accepted as a part of China for quite a long time. Taiwan operates entirely independently. It has its own legislature, its own military, its own executive. It is an independent country in de facto terms, even if it's not in de jure terms. So the idea that you know, the Taiwanese would see what's happened in Hong Kong and leave, I, I, don't, like, it's, I don't think that that's the case. And, what I think has happened is seeing the speed at which Hong Kong has lost its freedoms has been a reminder of the power of China's, of the power of kind of uh, China's ability to repress a system. So I think a lot of media reporting, for example, will say that uh, the decline in Hong Kong is what caused the Taiwanese to vote for Tsai Ing-wen. Again, I don't think that's true. There are there are polls from 1990, from 1998, from the year 2000, where 90% of Taiwanese say that they would never accept one country, two systems as their political system. But, you know, it is another example uh, for the Taiwanese to understand and to remind themselves of the fact that 90% of them don't want to be a part of China. So I think it's kind of important to understand the, the distinct issue, but now we see Hong Kong is fleeing to Taiwan um, we see Taiwan accepting Hong Kong refugees, and so that kind of civil society relationship is growing. But the political the political systems, I think, are still very, very different as experiences. Thank you. Um, do either of the Mark or Alan want to add anything? Uh, I might just, just sort of say a couple of things. I mean, I think Natasha's absolutely right, and I would. It's certainly what's happening in Hong Kong has focused the mind of many. people people, but particularly the Taiwanese, on what, what fate might await them. Um, so that's, that's coming through clearly. But in terms of the region, um, you know, I think there are two distinct approaches uh, to what's happened in Hong Kong and the conclusions that are drawn. There is one side of the, of the argument that, well, we don't want that to happen to us, so we're going to push back and seek to balance China's power, and that's the sort of Australian position. But there's another opposite view that, well, we don't want what's happened in Hong Kong to happen to us, so maybe we better just um, not necessarily appease China, but we better be very careful about pushing back. And if you go through the Southeast Asian countries, you'll see that there's the, the positions of each country are somewhere along that spectrum, so there's no unified view or take away from what's happening in Hong Kong for the region. You get a lot of people who think it's a really bad thing, we've got to ensure it doesn't happen here. Others are saying, well, our view is that we'd better give China what it wants uh, up to a point anyway, because the same thing could, could occur. So I think that's interesting to see how the dynamics, dynamics of that, how they're playing out in Southeast Asia in particular. Thank you. Do you want to add anything, Mark? Oh, just on the historical comment, um, uh, following on from Natasha's comments and Alan's, um, yeah, if you th uh, the, the Hong Kong and Taiwanese stories are really, really different. Um, when you look at Taiwan under the martial law period, there was a very large overseas Taiwanese community, particularly in the United States, of people who did leave because of authoritarianism, and they formed a, a very significant dissident community. Um, and you know, famously, there was an assassination attempt against uh, Jiang Jingwu, the son of Chiang Kai-shek in New York in, in 1971. And the World United Formosans for Independence were classified as a terrorist group by the FBI in the 1970s. So there's just a really, really intense history um, which speaks to um, the differences between um, Hong Kong and Taiwan and some of those really you know, intense politics that the Taiwan has generated over many decades. And of course, were Taiwan to fall under the authority of Beijing, again, in, in some circumstances, um, all of that would come back um, extremely intensely. Uh, I think much, much more intensely than, than uh, governments around the world, particularly Australia, fully appreciate at any level. It would be very, very dramatic and very challenging. Thank you, thank you Mark. And I, I think we're going to go to the floor here. Any questions here? Uh, Martin, you were the... First, to put your hand up. Hello. Is that on? Just the question. So, it's on. Oh, well, the, 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 the microphone will, be, will pick it up. Oh, yeah. That's just a prop. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just go back to the military side of things. Um, 
China has dealt with pesky people by swamping them. That's evident in Tibet, Xinjiang, and now in Hong Kong, where people are being not discouraged from leaving, but lots and lots of people from China are being encouraged to go to Hong Kong. There's a saying that I heard in China that was, the old dog with Leoran, keep the island, kill the people. And that, I think, together with the sorts of military approaches that China is taking towards Taiwan with the missiles. The last I heard, well, the first I heard that there were a thousand cruise missiles on the coast of China aimed at Taiwan. And I think they've been increasing them by a thousand a year to the point where they're probably targeted every little substation on the whole island. The military approach is, is pretty um, concerning. And if they do a sudden attack and destroy all Taiwan's infrastructure, that's going to be a very big problem. What, what do you see the solution to that? So do you, do you want me to respond to that? Hey, I, go, I, on, go on, Alan. Yeah, I, sorry, I think I got the gist of that. So what I would say is when I, was, when I started off life as an intelligence analyst, I remember my boss told me, he said, look, Alan, you don't worry about what countries say, look at what they do, okay? So if you look at how China has developed and um, focused its military, it's clearly done that, uh, it's clearly been driven by two factors. One, the need to prevent the US from being able to intervene militarily so China can then enforce its will on Taiwan. And secondly, to develop what we call an amphibious capability because if you want to subjugate Taiwan, you have to occupy it. You can do all kinds of things. You can have trade blockades, you can attack its infrastructure, but ultimately, uh, that's unlikely to bring Taiwan to heel. So you, you have to occupy the country. And to do that, you have to have the ability to ferry about a million plus troops from the mainland, about 130 kilometres across to Taiwan, which is a very mountainous uh, little uh, island, and impose your will by force, all right? So that is the strategy that China appears to be following. If you look at the facts on the ground, you look at its military capabilities, Everything is, is designed to do those two things, to enable it to, to ferry a very large proportion of its military forces into Taiwan so it can occupy it. So that, that sort of explains a lot of what China's doing. That's why there are so many missiles there. And some of those missiles are designed to target Taiwan, but a lot of them are designed to take down American aircraft and American aircraft carriers. So they're multi-purpose. Uh, so they put a missile umbrella over the island to prevent anyone else from interfering. And then you build up the military naval capabilities to get all your troops over to, um, to Taiwan so you can occupy the island. So that's what's been going on militarily. So I think that explains a lot. If you look at what they're doing and not necessarily listen to what China is saying, you can see they've got to the tipping point now. I think in the next three to five years, they will have the capability to launch an amphibious assault on Taiwan and it will be very difficult for Taiwan to defend against uh, over time. So that's why I think the military balance has become, has shifted so decisively and that even if the Taiwanese were able to inflict massive casualties on China, which I think that on the PLA, which I think they would, ultimately the PLA would prevail, just the force of numbers. Anyone else? Uh, I would just briefly chime in. I think I probably see it slightly differently. Um, for the longest time, you know, I don't disagree on those issues of military balance. I, you know, I think that those, those questions are clear. For me, it's a question of intent. Um, for the longest time, the United States and other countries, I think, have deterred China's aggression through their own military capabilities, as well as other signs of political support. Those have not been efforts to try to secure Taiwan's independence, but to try to defer China's invasion. I think if we kind of flip that logic on its head, I would argue that China's military buildup and uh, aggression towards Taiwan is to try to deter a declaration of independence and other countries recognizing Taiwan as independent, to deter Taiwan from succeeding, seceding in China's eyes, 
rather than uh, trying to secure that kind of annexation or invasion. You know, I agree that's kind of the long term goal, but you know, I think Alan said earlier that he thought there was a 50% chance of something like that happening in the next decade. I would argue it's closer to 20% from my perspective. I think it's important to understand the difference from Beijing's perspective of maintaining some version of status quo where Taiwan is not in their eyes really independent and hasn't been recognized as independent from the rest by the rest of the world and actually making Taiwan a part of China. Could I just say, uh, just coming very quickly there, so I think you're right, Natasha, but I think where I sort of differ from you in this, I think that deterring Taiwan from declaring independence has been a clear, a, a, a clear tenet of Chinese policy for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I think they've moved from that now to looking uh, to developing a capability to to essentially impose itself militarily on China. They move from defer deterrence now to a position, a military position of being able to force Taiwan to reunify with the mainland. I think that that's where I see a really key shift in the last three to five years. Now, this is, of course, being debated endlessly by all sorts of experts, but that's the way I see the shift. And that's why I think it's quite dangerous. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't really disagree with that. I think, though, for me, there's a difference between the capability and using the capability, I guess, and that's where a lot of people are going to disagree because it's, frankly, very unclear. Thank you. Uh, do you want to add anything, Mark? Um, only I'd probably just go down the middle there between um, um, Natasha and Alan. I would say um, just one very quick point about the missiles number of missiles actually aimed at Taiwan has been reducing over the last several years. So there was a really big build-up through the 2000s, and then um, over the last decade or so, they've actually been winding those numbers back, which is quite interesting in terms of intent and, and strategy and so on. Um, I guess I'd pose a question in some ways to Alan, which is a million soldiers on Taiwan. Um, that's a huge uh, resource drain upon China to, um, to sustain that number of troops essentially indefinitely all of Taiwan's security vulnerabilities then become China's security vulnerabilities. And so we talk about blockades, you know, then you could blockade Taiwan, um, the United States could do it uh, to prevent uh, the PLA from resupplying its soldiers. So I think, uh, and I think Alan, you've alluded to this, that it really does depend on exactly how things play out. And there are a number of different outcomes that one could, one could see um, depending on the exact circumstances uh, if, if China took any action. Um, it could end up as a, a I, my view is it could end up very easily as an unimaginable disaster for China. Um, and I think Beijing is conscious of that possibility. Yes, thank you. Um, and uh, we've got another question here in the, on the floor. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Jared McGougal from the University of Melbourne. Uh, should China take stronger action against uh, Taiwan? And uh, we certainly focused on that uh, this evening. Yeah interested in the uh, panel's views as to how um, uh, they would play out politically within Taiwan. For example, with the uh, KMT, the uh, well, elements, significant elements, be prepared to um, cooperate with China in the hope of getting uh, uh, some kind of accommodation or some kind of deal that uh, might lean a little bit more in um, Taiwan's direction. And I think in the past at one point, in terms of China's position on one country, two systems, there was a suggestion that um, Taiwan could retain its own military forces. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think one country, two systems is uh, a dead duck, but uh, uh, Mark. Yeah, uh, just very quickly on, on the military thing. I mean, that's the most bizarre aspect of, uh, of, of China's uh, policies towards Taiwan. There's literally half a sentence about Taiwan may keep its military in, in the document. You know, there's vast amount of documents that, that China produces, which of course makes no sense at all. It's, it's uh, inconceivable that Taiwan could maintain a US supplied military force. F-16s are not gonna become part of the PLA at any time. So they all have to be sent back to the United States, all of that hardware. And uh, it really points to China not actually having a, uh, it talks about peaceful reunification, but it doesn't actually have any kind of roadmap to achieve any of those things, which is interesting in terms of the irrationality or the strangeness of its policy. 
in terms of the KMT or, or, or political uh, actors in Taiwan being willing to uh, sort of make accommodations, yeah, I, you know, one can think of a few uh, who probably saw pretty quickly on that. Um, but I think um, the majority, far and away, would actually react. I think that would be that. That's one of the things that you know, we don't see now at the moment. You know, Everyone's right. You know, there's people are fairly sanguine about things. It's a fairly low-key um, debate on 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 the possibility of, of action by China. But if it actually took any action, uh, then you'd see a counter response. And we saw that with the Sunflower Movement in 2014, uh, where uh, the then KMT government uh, tried to push through a free trade agreement in services and um, other things with Beijing, and um, 300 un uh, university students stormed the legislature and occupied it for three weeks. Um, the actual, you know, the parliament, the national parliament of Taiwan. So um, I think if there's any action by China, it will generate really, really intense politics, um, completely unmanageable politics for Beijing. Uh, I, can, I mean, you think Hong Kong um, in uh, 2019, you multiply that by about 100, and I think is what we would see um, in Taiwan. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Anyone else? Okay, let's go. We've got another question at the back there, please. If you'd like to take your mask off, actually, that's easier for you. Good. Um, so, Professor Four, I just wanted to say to Mark that um, I'm near generation from Taiwan. So, um, yes, you're right. We want to be recognized as Taiwanese internationally. And my question is, under the circumstances, um, I, don't, I believe no one actually want to have any kind of the situation which is war in the future. So is there any possible um, Australian can have any economically support to Taiwan, like more future agreements or um, more um, international, let's say, exchange student program to help or, um, for example, when we mentioned about the semiconductor, that Taiwan has this kind of industry that is able to collaborate with um, Australia industry as well. Is there any possible in the near future? Thank Thank, thanks very much. So are there ways in which Australia can get involved more with Taiwan and particularly uh, to, to help build uh, Taiwan resilience? Uh, yeah, there are. Um, there's, there's a million things that we could do. Um, the free trade agreement is, um, is one that's been bouncing around for a while, but the, um, the federal government has resisted moving that forward, mostly because of pressure from Beijing. Um, so I think there's a great deal that could happen. There are you know, voices in our, um, our public life and in our, our, our government in Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and so on and Defence, who are really wanting to do uh, more things with Taiwan and develop the relationship. I think there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty. I think Beijing has been very effective at creating um, uh, concerns in a government and in public institutions about possible risks in dealing with Taiwan. So there is active resistance. Um, so um, uh, there's lots that we could do, I think, uh, there needs to be more political will. Um, I'm interested in whether or not uh, the US actions towards Taiwan, which have been very, very positive, lots of things, uh, really important things have happened. Um, to what extent that'll start to shift thinking in, in Canberra um, and apply some pressure to Canberra. Um, uh, Australia has actually been very timorous towards Taiwan over the last few years. Um, so I'd certainly would encourage um, people who are interested to, to um, you know, to ask questions about what we're doing and what we could be doing in order to, to generate a bit more um, impetus for this. Thank you. The other two? This is uh, I would just add to Mark, I think you're absolutely right. Australia has been very timorous towards Taiwan, along with just about everybody else, I might add, and, mm -hmm. and the, for the obvious reason that no one wants to jeopardise relations with China for economic and political reasons. However, What's really quite interesting is how there's a bit of a shift on uh, among quite a few countries to actually look again at Taiwan and an asymmetric response to China's coercive tactics is to actually build up relations with Taiwan, perhaps on, on trade and politically as well. And the US is starting to do that, but other countries are thinking through maybe we should be doing the same thing too. 
that's an indirect way of making the point to China that we are going to defend democracies, but not necessarily in the way that China thinks. And it's more more difficult to China to deal with that. I mean, they can they they can be critical and vitriolic in their public commentary, but what are they actually going to do about it? So that's an example of of a kind of asymmetric response that democracies are now looking at in the pushback against China that's now starting to spread. I think uh, it's including Europe. If you look at the last meeting of the G7, uh, you look at the, the notions of having a D10, a, a group of democracies. How do you push back against coercion, Chinese style? Not just China, of course, it's more broadly authoritarianism, but, but how do you do it? And maybe we need to be thinking a bit more uh, creatively about uh, defending democracies other than just military options, right? Which, of course, nobody wants to go down that track. So I think it's very interesting how this is playing out. And I would be watching this space very carefully over the next 12 months. And Australia may actually get on board and start to be less timorous, Mark, than they have been in the past. Good. Let's all hope. And uh, Natasha, you're going to have the last word. Oh, well, that's a great responsibility. Look, I don't... Uh, I would agree with everything that's been said. I would say I'm a little surprised that uh, Australia's relationship with China has soured in such a dramatic way. There's been such little concern for irritating Beijing on a whole range of issues, and that hasn't yet translated into stronger Taiwan policy. And I think that's interesting. And like the others, I think that could change. But I suppose if it's the last word, I would also say, Australia could learn a lot from Taiwan, as Mark mentioned. Yes, there are ways we can boost Taiwan's resilience, but for example, as a country that's been the target of uh, sustained economic coercion from China for a year and a half, uh, we could look at a country that's been the target of sustained economic coercion from China for a couple of decades and how they've dealt with it. We could look at how Taiwan's dealt with cyber attacks. We could look at how Taiwan's dealt with indigenous reconciliation. You know, Australia has a lot to share in the world, but also I think has a lot to learn and Taiwan's a great place to look. Thank you. That's a terrific thought on which to end. I'd like to, uh, on behalf of everyone, uh, you who are watching on Zoom and you who are in the room with us here in, in East Melbourne, to thank uh, very much um, uh, Natasha Kassam, Alan Dupont and Mark Harrison for brilliant, comprehensive, in, informed remarks tonight on a massively important uh, topic. And to uh, thank everyone here at the Australian Institute for International Affairs, Victoria Branch for uh, uh, arranging the evening. And next week, at this very time, uh, back in the same place, I will be talking with the great Australian sinologist, Jeremy Barme. He'll be zooming in from New Zealand to talk about the Chinese Communist Party's centenary. Very, that it promises to be a very interesting discussion too. So thanks everyone for your time tonight.